three Atlantic provinces in one day is a job for a Nautilus. I'm Steph. <laughs> I'm Jay. And this is Water Motoring. Ahoy, mateys. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Maritimes <laughs> joke, in case you didn't catch it. So we've spent the last couple of days in Nova Scotia. We dipped into New Brunswick for a brief moment, and we spent the day driving around PEI, and we are back in Nova Scotia with the all-new 2024 Lincoln Nautilus. And in fact, we visited all three of those provinces in one day, which, if you know anything about Canada, this country is vast, and there are very few places where you can get to three provinces in one day because each province is pretty big too. And this might be the only place in the country where you can do this comfortably in a loop in one day. So pretty cool. Check it out at roadtripper.ca. I'm going to write about it if that travel aspect of it happens to interest you. But here we're going to talk about the car. So this is the 2024 Lincoln Nautilus, as Jay mentioned, completely redesigned. Last time we drove one of these, we were under the impression that we were not going to be driving one of these ever again. Because they killed off the Edge, mm -hmm. and Edge and Nautilus shared a platform in 2022 when we had it. But here we are. Formerly built in Oakville, Ontario, which is why they were to built together, shared a platform. Oakville's being retooled for EVs, and this is now built in China. I love that they brought back the Continental door handles. Pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Nice little touch there. Not much for aerodynamics, but this is not really the aerodynamic car. But no, I, and I appreciate it. I, I really do. Up front, you have a fancy little dancing light pattern when you start and stop the vehicle. Nice long light bar and the Lincoln Star illuminates, which is pretty cool. Not really a new thing for luxury vehicles, but I'm happy the Lincoln's jumped onto it. And around the rear, you have a similar long light bar. And the turret signals, if you feel they have been seen before, I draw comparisons to the Kia EV6. Here's our disagreement point. I find the side profile of this 24 shares a lot with the previous model. I find it's more aviator-ish. Really? Yeah, I, with the I, black, I, the floating roof style. and. I still see a lot of the old Nautilus mm, on the I, side, but that, that's just me. Uh, quick note, going back to the front, the only way you can differentiate the hybrid from the gasoline is primarily that the front Lincoln Star is blue for the hybrid and chrome for the gasoline on the front of the door panels. It's blue for the hybrid, unless you get the blackout package and that takes away the blue. So blackout package hybrid, the only way you can tell is by having again, that blue star up front. It says nothing on the trunk lid, no engine size, no numbers, no letters. Very similar to Porsche. They have the word Lincoln behind a hard piece of plastic. Can't really see it all that well, but it eh, doesn't really bother me all that much. Let's start with the big thing for Lincoln, and it's their 48-inch screen. It's split into two pieces, seamed very nicely together. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you jump in to the driver's side stuff, because you're driving, yeah. and then I'll jump into the passenger side stuff. Sure. So the way that Lincoln has set out this screen makes a lot of sense once you talk through it. The panel that's right in front of the driver is split into the section to the left, which is directly beneath the driver's vision, covers the critical information that you need. So your speed, your speed limits, your um, gear position, your fuel gauge, all that stuff stays on the left side, doesn't move, can't be adjusted, other than you can play with the steering wheel and, and bring some different things up, but that stays where it is. Just to the right of that, if you have it activated, and we need to talk about the fact that this doesn't activate in CarPlay, which we've only just realized. If you have a navigation destination programmed with Google Maps embedded, that's in the infotainment system, then it will show you the full map of your route on the small screen down here, the 11 inch screen. 11.1 inch. Yes, to be technical. Let's not get people angry. <laughs> <laughs> and then up on the larger screen, you get the turn by turn. So what's nice about that, and a lot of what Lincoln has set up here is that it functions almost like a head up display in the fact that your eyes really stay up toward the road. The flat top steering wheel gives you great vision of everything. I know you don't like it as much. I like it a lot because I can see everything on the screen. The wheel doesn't get in the way. Just hold on, I'm almost okay, done. Okay, okay. I'm almost done. And then it's not, it's even better 
in a sense than a head-up display because the graphics I find are easier to see than when you project something onto the glass. Here's my issue with it. It's turning an oval, whereas almost every other car through the past hundred years has had a circular steering wheel. So it just, it feels funny when you put your hand over hand uh -huh. and it just, an oval is not a circle. Okay, but if you're driving the way that you're supposed to, and I'm certainly not saying everyone drives the way that you're supposed to. Which is com completely fair. Yes, when you've got where your, your hands on nine and three, know, where they should I be, know, you don't notice that I difference know. at all. Blue Cruise, I have tried for the first time in this vehicle, and Blue Cruise, as you may or may not know, is Ford and Lincoln's answer to G General Motors Super Cruise, a fully hands-free highway driving system, only works on divided highways, but it's hundreds of thousands of kilometers of divided highways that you can use it on. But you cannot use it in PEI. And there's nowhere in <laughs> Prince Edward Island that has a divided highway, That's so we okay. didn't test it there. But we did test it between Halifax and Fox Harbor, which was our home base for this trip. Mm -hmm. I like Blue Cruise better than Super Cruise. It works with sunglasses, or at least it works with my sunglasses. Works with my sunglasses too. I don't recall having an issue with the sunglasses in Super Cruise, but you were saying that you did have issues getting it to work with your sunglasses. Yep, on. I did a 500 kilometer road trip in the new Lyric, um, and sunglasses are a no-go. And I've got regular sunglasses, they're just regular Ray-Bans. Nothing's fancy about them. But anyway, back to this. Yeah, back to this. So Blue Cruise, I find, it does dive into the curves a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll be centered in the lane, and then you start toward the curve, and it just nicks toward the right of the lane before it starts to turn in, so you feel like you're not staying centered. Okay. But that, to me, is better than the sawing motion on the wheel that you get from Super Cruise as it's trying to stay centered in the lane going around the curve. Now. Having done 3,000 kilometers in Super Cruise and only 100 in this, it could very well be that with a longer trip, I had more to pick apart about Blue Cruise. But as it stands right now, I wouldn't pay to add Super Cruise to a vehicle. I would consider paying to add Blue Cruise to a vehicle because I like it that much better. One thing to note about Blue Cruise, and this is not any different from Super Cruise, is that it is not a fully autonomous system. And I'll tell you why. Here in the East Coast especially, there are a lot of potholes. And when we say potholes, we mean more like chasms. Mm. And as much as the system can do a lot of things, it cannot spot those for you. And so you do need to be ready to take over this system at any time. We had a couple of moments on the highway here in Nova Scotia where we needed to take over because we needed to dodge those potholes or else we were gonna be diving toward the core of the earth because they're so huge. On the right side of the screen, after that brief but yes, necessary detour, so I have three panels that I can adjust, customize, and flip around with seven different options in total. So the options are fuel economy, tire pressure, trip one, trip two, weather, which is five, a clock, and your audio. So it's just a simple slide and lift and slide to the three blank panels at the top, get what you want, and once you have your three, you can also arrange them any way you want. Now you can do things like watch movies or play video games or have a fireplace as it turns out. That's all done through this smaller center screen and only when the car is stopped. So the moment you're in motion, even one kilometer an hour, yeah. no deal. But it is there. So it's kind of cool to have all that functionality. Lincoln's just chosen a different way to implement it. And it's one that minimizes driver distraction potential. One thing I don't like is that Lincoln has now made it screen only to change the direction of the air. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about which vent you want activated. Before you could just slide up, slide down, slide left, slide right to change where the air is going. And individual vents, yeah. But now everything is through the screen. There's lots of customization just like the new Porsche Cayenne has, but I don't know. I don't think it was necessary. I think it's overly engineered and Everything is done through the screen. The temperature, the seat adjustments, many of the seat adjustments, not every single one, but a lot of them. I love these seats so very much. Not only because they have an awesome massage function, which they do with a bunch of different settings, mm -hmm. but also you can adjust each individual thigh. Your lumbar uh, has three different positions you can adjust. Your much. side bolsters, thigh bolsters. It is a lot, but once you find it, you stud it and it joins your profile and then it's just there every time you get in the car. Right, it's fine. an expensive upgrade. So 
you got to be really deep into luxury vehicle budget territory to be able to equip it. But if you've got that and you really are looking for the pinnacle, I would say for me, these are among the best seats in the luxury world I've found. Lincoln has kept their piano key gear selector. Yeah. There's nowhere else it can go because your wiper stock takes the place of a column shifter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind it. You don't have a lot of hand traffic where it is. The upgraded Rebel Audio system, pretty good for me. Mm. We haven't spent a ton of time in the back seats, but we can tell you they look pretty darn cavernous. Yeah, just looking back here, uh, you could have a long-legged person absolutely have pretty much the height of comfort back there. On the cargo side of things, things are a little different between the gas and the hybrid version. Figures are on the screen with the seats up and the seats down. So it pretty much doubles when you go from seats up to seats down, mm -hmm. uh, which tells me that your rear seat passengers have a lot, a lot, a lot of space back there. At launch, we have two powertrains available here, a gas-only powertrain and a hybrid. And so here we go with the power figures. So for the gasoline version, runs off a two liter turbo four cylinder, 250 horsepower, 280 pound feet of torque, all wheel drive. And if we go on the hybrid side, still uses a two liter turbo four and power figures are now 310 total output and 295 pound-feet of torque. Again, all-wheel drive. They told us it's an eCVT, and then they immediately said, but it's not actually an eCVT. That's just what everybody calls it. What so, do they call it? A dual? It's a, it's motors. It's not a pulley system. Right. So right. it's not what a traditional CVT would be considered. Now, I'm going to jump in first on the driving side, which is weird because I'm not driving now. Mm. I drove the hybrid first, which is what we did yesterday. Yeah. And all day today, we were in the gasoline. We are in the gasoline model. The hybrid is just a little lacking in off the line power mm -hmm. for me. And I'm not drag racing. I'm not beating somebody to the next stoplight. But just that initial squeeze down with your right foot is a little underwhelming in the hybrid. But in the gasoline model, it's very responsive. I get a lot of feedback right away. What are your thoughts? I actually agree with you completely. I was yeah, very surprised <laughs> to find that I like the gas a little better. That really shocked me because typically the little bit of electric boost that you get from a hybrid helps it out. Didn't find that to be the case so much here. Now, Lincoln did tell us the engineering behind the hybrid powertrain is intended more for efficiency than performance. Speaking of efficiency, there's a point that I want to make here. So mm -hmm. let's talk about fuel consumption so that we can set that up. All right, so on the gasoline version, we are at a combined 9.8 mm -hmm. as far as liters per 100 kilometers go. On the hybrid, that dips down to 7.7 .7 liters per 100 kilometers. So there's a 2.1 liter per 100 kilometers difference slash savings if you opt for the hybrid. That said, here in Canada, at least, you're going to pay $3,500 more to equip the hybrid. And that's a straight up, you just tack $3,500 onto the price of what you're already setting up yep. in, in your configurator. Yep. And, and you flip your HP automatic transmission for an ECVT. Yep. Not an ECVT, but an ECVT. Yes. And then that's going to get you the hybrid. So when you're looking at a difference of $3,500, according to NRCAN, you're going to spend $600 more per year to operate the gas engine as opposed to the hybrid. So when you add that all up, it's gonna take you about six years to make up that price difference on choosing the hybrid purely on fuel consumption alone. But if you're in it for the long haul and you want a hybrid as far as uh, a choice in vehicle, I, it's not really that steep of a premium to pay. I guess ultimately if the hybrid was a more exciting or more interesting or more energetic driving machine, it might justify that extra price. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a shame that it doesn't, but I can't see myself choosing to pay that premium unless I truly believe I'm gonna keep this car for driving it into the ground, which I don't know that a lot of people are. I think a lot of people might choose this on a shorter term lease rather than something that they wanna own forever. Because there's mid soccer refreshes mm -hmm. and there's all sorts of new fun, exciting things happening in the automotive world, but I'm going long haul gasoline I'm going very, very short term, like maybe two, three year lease with the hybrid. The primary competitor to this by far in everyone's eyes, I think, is the Lexus RX. 
So it's the Lexus 350, which competes with the gasoline mm -hmm. Nautilus and the 350H HP for hybrid, competing with the Nautilus hybrid. They're only a couple thousand dollars apart price-wise right. on both. Generally speaking, the tech is extremely well executed. It's got Blue Cruise. It's got a lot going for it in terms of safety and equipment and the price is about equivalent. Yep, screens react fast, hardly any lag at all, which mm -hmm. is good and great. You can dress it up in all sorts of ways, big packages that get you all sorts of fun things. However... I think I would find it hard to justify paying the same amount for this as opposed to a Lexus RX if I wanted to keep something long term knowing the reputation that an RX comes with. So. Mm -hmm. If I was looking at a corporate lease or a uh, you know, personal lease for three or four, maybe five years, I think I'd choose this because I think I find the check is better executed. Oh. It's something that is new and fun and flashy and does everything well. Over the air updates yeah. as well here. And so there's going to be continual, I mean, that's probably the case with Lexus and a lot of vehicles these days as well, but there will be continual additions to the functionality in this vehicle. Mm -hmm. So on that kind of a timeline this makes a lot of sense especially if you like the functionality of everything better than in the rx if i was trying to buy something that i was intending to keep for a long time and drive into the ground i might tend to lean more toward the rx even knowing i don't enjoy the tech experience quite as much at the same time lincoln's kind of coming into a resurgence mm. so i don't know if i can fully I don't want to say fault them, but I don't know if I could hold it against them as strongly for not having the longevity success that Lexus has had, mm. because it's kind of like a new Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, we don't know what the reliability of and this is. It. We can tell you it's been good for two days. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you have any questions on the Nautilus, let us know in the comments. We'll do our best to get you answers as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm going to say as far as dipping into your wrap-up. So with that... Thanks so much for watching. <laughs> if you haven't already, please hit that button down there that lets you subscribe so you don't miss any more of our videos because we would love for you to see them and comment on them and let us know what you think. You can also find us on all the major social media platforms. So please reach out and thanks for watching. Goodbye, mateys. <laughs> <laughs>